Good afternoon. We are delighted that you are here. We have a special presentation today. The presentation that we have is uh, You Are the Key to Cancer Prevention. Our, by the way, I'm Becky Dawson. Uh, I'm the director at the Northeast Missouri AHEC office here in Kirksville. We serve 21 counties. But this particular uh, event is being um, also broadcast to our remote sites around the state so that other students and physicians can participate. Our office coordinates with the National AHEC office to, uh, who has a contract with CDC to promote HPV immunization so that uh, we can all move forward in uh, cancer prevention. We do have some handouts that are over on the table. Um, many of you receive these uh, electronically, so you're welcome to have those. The other thing that's on the tables and, uh, are uh, papers that are evaluations to give us feedback on the presentations and how you receive it and how you can use that uh, information in the future. Today, we are very fortunate to have a couple of physicians with us. Um, on our panel is Dr. Kent Campbell. Uh, as well as Dr. Melody Stocks. Dr. Ionis, was who is a pediatrician, was planning to be on the uh, panel today. However, she had a, a change in plans this morning, and so Dr. Stocks has agreed to uh, cover the information. So I will turn it over to Dr. Kent Campbell for him to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just really quickly wanted to welcome everyone and thank you for your attendance. The reason I'm here, when I first heard of this lecture, I seemed rather interested, of course, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, a close family member who developed cervical cancer, and um, I was around when the vaccine first came out, and so I wanna just kind of give you my perspective. We talk a lot about preventing cancer, and really, um, we talk about things like um, um, lifestyle modification, you know, don't smoke, follow the right diet, um, try to get to your ideal body weight, et cetera. And while those things may reduce your cancer risk, I don't think they really prevent cancer the way two different interventions that have been, uh, have been uh, quite uh, increased in prevalence since I've been in practice. Those were colonoscopy and removing colon polyps because while not every colon polyp turns cancerous, I guarantee you that every cancer, every colon cancer started as a polyp. So in my opinion, if you remove a colon polyp, you've prevented cancer. I think the same thing goes for HPV vaccination. If you don't get HPV, you're not gonna get cervical cancer. So I'm a huge proponent of it. When it first came out, um, parents, mostly the mothers would say, wow, I'm not sure I wanna give my young child, uh, a young female, a vaccine for something that's sexually transmitted. Are we promoting sexual activity in these young, in these young individuals? And I said, no, 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 we're trying to prevent cancer. Um, now I use, I, Later in my practice, I used the approach that, hey, look, we're preventing cancer. And so I think this is one of the best things you can do for your young female, uh, your daughters, and now, of course, your sons. Let's eliminate the vector as well. So that's my perspective. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Melanie Socks, and she's going to give you the rest of the lecture. Just stand up over here. Since I'm the only one. Hi, I'm Melody Stocks. I don't think I've met all the new students yet, but hopefully we'll see you in the office or such and at the remote sites i um, hope you find this somewhat interesting i'm not going to go through every slide because some of them are really boring but we'll try to go through some so hpv is something that i would probably be out of a job except for the babies part um at least gynecology wise um we'd have a lot less if we didn't have um this this virus so uh, hopefully that part of my practice, I will say it's already decreased. We do PAPs way less frequently than we did before, which leads to less colposcopies, less elite procedures, and there will be less cancer. Um, that being said, my last patient I diagnosed with cervical cancer was probably three months ago when she was 32 years old and not yet done having children. So it, it still is definitely out there and a problem. Um, before PAP smears were a routine um, in the 30s and 40s, the major cause of death of women in the the age 30s age group was cervical cancer. Um, so it's it's a big deal. We don't see it as much. You guys probably don't see it as much as I do. But um, that and then the morbidities from uh, HPV vaccines, just the, H, the genital warts, all those things, it, it really is an issue that I see on a daily basis. So 
We do have the vaccine. Um, the vaccine came out just as I started residency. So pretty much all the time that I've been practicing, um, it's been available and it is widely more accepted than it was when it first came out, which is awesome. So up and down arrows, let's see, side to side. side, to side. All right, so we're gonna talk about the burden of HPV disease. Um, the importance of vaccination for cancer prevention. And I still think it's important to prevent the other issues that come along with HPV. Um, rationale for vaccinating at young ages, why we give it to both males and females. And then at the end is a, a questions parents may ask, ways to address those that may make it more likely for the parent to agree to vaccination. Um, so I don't have anything to disclose. Um, HPV infects, there's two different main categories when we talk to patients. It's all the same type of virus, but there's some that of course affect the skin. You get the warts on the hands, plantar warts, that type of thing. And then we have our more mucus um, sites of infection, um, the larynx, the anus, um, and the vagina. Although this does extend to the skin, I see plenty of um, papilloma on the thighs and buttocks, so it's it's everywhere. Um, and then in the, the HPV, the genital types of HPV, we have both the low and high risk types. We don't test for low risk types, we just assume that there are six and 11, that's what's causing the problem. You can actually get low risk typing on your um, pap smear through the pathologist, but it's not recommended by anyone, so I'm not even sure why you can check that box. So don't check it, ever. High risk only. Um, we want to know specifically, and now we can do genotyping on HPV. So we specifically want to know if it's a type 16 or 18 because those cause the most significant uh, cancer burden in our country. And I do routinely do genotyping on patients who are high risk HPV positive now, if they have a normal pap smear. Um, high risk uh, types, types of cancer that are associated, cervical cancer, of course, um, anal genital cancers, and I do see those in connection patients with uh, anal cancer um, as well as cervical cancer, or pharyngeal cancer, um, and of course the precancerous lesions. Um, most patients, it's actually 80% of people will be infected at some point in time if they have not used condoms. If you use condoms 100% of the time, it is actually almost 100% preventative, but it's not 100%, there's still some risk. Um, and most people don't use a condom at some point. The, the rates of actually getting infected in college is huge. It's, it is close to 80% of college age females who have never been sexually active, they become sexually active during college. Those that use condoms 100% of the time, rarely did they ever actually get HPV, but it was 80% of people who ever had sex one time without a condom. Um, and it, I mean, it's, there's a decent burden. Cervical cancer is a lot less frequent than it was um, in the past because we do have pap smears to screen. We can treat with LEAP procedures, um, but it's still, it's still a major cancer burden. And it's not very well treatable once they develop cancer. So I can honestly say most cervical cancer patients I've ever seen died. Um, the other uh, thing to note in men, um, we see a lot more of the oropharynx cancers. There are a lot of HPV-related cancers. I've had a patient 28 years old, hadn't smoked for five years. She stopped smoking at 23 and developed an HPV tongue cancer. Um, she had surgery on her tongue twice uh, when she was pregnant, two different pregnancies, um, and major next dissection. So it's, it's a, a real deal that we do see. Um, and I do, when patients ask me about the oropharynx cancer, I try to tell them when they come in the office with high-risk HPV of the cervix and we're doing this, I'm like, yeah, your partner probably is at risk for this, but sorry, there's nothing we can do about it now. Um, typically, I mean, it's not, you can see, like as far as the ethnicities, typically um, it goes a different way. So sometimes there's more black patients with like cervical cancer, but as far as like anogenital cancers more, is more white. I, Across the board, it probably ends up being about the same. It's not one that we see um, major ethnicity differences in. If you really want those stats, I'm sure we can email you the breakdown. Um, and for women, cervical cancer is one of the most common HPV-associated cancers. I do see some vulvar cancer related to it. Um, half of cervical cancers occur in women under 50. The youngest I've seen is 28. 
but you can see it's still, it's a fairly large um, section, 25% of those, the 20, age 25 to 39 year age group, which is not where we see much cancer. We expect it in our older patients. So we see lots of HPV related disease every day. And now I do tell patients HPV is preventative. Um, actually, until I did this talk the last time, I usually said that the, vi the vaccine prevents HPV infection, um, but now I actually specifically say the HPV vaccine prevents cancer, and I find that that is, well, better received with parents. Um, the vaccine is a virus-like particle. There is no way you can get HPV from the vaccine, despite people saying that they did. Um, it's non-infectious. It's non oncogenic, there's nothing that you can do, and it does produce higher levels of the antibody than the actual infection would. The um, types that are included in the only type of vaccine that we use, which is Gardasil 9, you get your 6 and 11, which are your non-oncogenic types, and then the, the, the uh, other seven are all high-risk types, and 16 and 18 are still um, our biggest players. But this, now I can tell patients, um, the new Gardasil 9 prevents 90% of cervical cancers. It was 70%. So 90% of cervical cancer and 90% of genital warts. So it's still not 100%, but it's a huge, huge number. CDC recommends starting age 11, 12. You can start as young as nine years. Um, it is, it says two doses of vaccine, but it's actually three. There was a second one out, so you get, um, oh, maybe they do it younger. That could have changed. I don't do 15 and under very often. We still typically give um, three doses of the HPV vaccine, so I'll have to look at that maybe a change. But we give three doses um, for our population. So we have a large Medicaid population, and we can, in our office, vac vaccinate under the age of 18. So most people I'm giving it to are 19 to 26 age group. We do the doses same follows the same schedule as like the H or the hepatitis B vaccine. So you give one another six weeks to two months later, and the another one four months after that. My kids are going to be really excited though if they only have to get two shots instead of three. <laughs> so um, we do start as early as nine, and they do recommend starting um, the series before their thirteenth birthday. Do you know why? Anybody? Many people start having sex. Yes. So it only works if you get in first, and people don't want to say that, but I have a 13-year-old pregnant girl right now, so um, it's really important to start that before age 13 if possible. Um, the vaccine safety system, the, the vaccine invest, adverse event reporting system is the most common one. This is what you're going to get. Um, if patients go online to report an adverse event, they can report whatever they want. Just because it's reported does not mean that it's actually connected to the vaccine. So there's crazy things on there. Um, and you'll find it all online. There's tons of websites about how bad Gardasil is and different organizations, and they have all kinds of complications. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, there is, there's well over 10 years of HPV vaccine safety data since we've been vaccinating the general population. They have probably close to 10 years prior to starting um, routine vaccination. This is a long time now. Um, so the main reaction that people get is actually pain. It is a painful vaccination and also syncope. So you're supposed to watch the patient for 20 minutes after vaccines, um, after this vaccination specifically that they don't pass out. Um, obviously, if they've never, if they've had a, a reaction to the vaccine, um, or allergy to yeast, which I don't know if I've ever had somebody tell me that they've had a yeast allergy. Um, they just, allergic. yeah, I've seen that. Ha did the patient actually have it, or they just tell you they had it? I'm allergic to yeast, so I can't get the vaccine. Interesting. Okay. I have people tell me lots of other things, like they have systemic yeast running through their blood, and that's why they. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, but I haven't, I'm not sure I've seen a legit yeast allergy. Um, and I said the brief uh, fainting spells I'm, can be related to that too. So they recommend here 15 minutes. Um, we do 20 minutes in our office. Um, the sa vaccine safety is the same as any other vaccine safety, um, and there's not anything that they've actually been able to associate it as a legitimate complication of this vaccine. 
Um, other than the syncope does definitely seem to be connected. And I don't know if that's the age group in getting shots or if it's the, the vaccine itself. Um, so they look at HPV vaccine impact. More and more this data is coming out all the time now that it has been out about 10 years. Um, they saw very quickly that the HPV prevalence when they're looking through and they, they'll do studies where they just have somebody swab themselves, you know, every month. Um, that decreased, general wart rates have decreased. Um, the precancers decreased and they're just now starting to come up with some of the decreases in rates of HPV associated cancers. The, um, you could see this, the change in prevalence of HPV um, after each, and it's, it's definitely decreasing, which makes sense. It's an effective vaccine. We, um, the other thing I will say that they, they put over data is in other countries where the vaccination is mandatory, they see way better data than we have. Because even though we don't have a mandatory vaccine, um, we have a hard time getting all of the patients to get all doses of vaccine. So a lot of our patients are only partially vaccinated against HPV. The, um, I get this question a lot, how long is this vaccine going to last? Do I need a booster? And the, the truth is we don't know yet, just like we didn't know with the MMR vaccine, we're learning more about pertussis and revaccinating. So I don't know, it may be decades before we know for sure. But we do know that most patients are going to get HPV in their early 20s, um, late teens, early 20s. Um, so we know that during the highest risk time for acquiring the virus that you are going to get your maximum protection. Um, they show that probably at least 10 years of protection. Um, but again, it's not something that we know, we know for sure yet because it just hasn't been out there. Um, so talking about um, the vaccine coverage. You can see um, they just, and this is interesting, so they talk about the different um, vaccinations that you could have starting with our Tdap, which we, we're pretty good about. Parents understand tetanus and that kind of thing. You come down here and this is getting actually three in the male and three in the female uh, vaccination rates. It's, it's way lower. And I see that all the time. I ask my patients um, under the age of 26 when they come in and so many of them like, I got one shot, I got two shots. We try to finish out their course. Um, so the main reason, I was surprised the first time I saw this, this slide, but the main reason that parents don't start the vaccination process is because it wasn't recommended. Um, well, I should say that that's a significant reason. Um, I definitely still get patients who say that it's, it's not necessary. We don't think that we need it. They don't understand what HPV does. Um, there's a lot of things that came and they do find that when they pull parents, we think they the parents just don't wanna give it, but actually most parents do think that um, it's an important thing. So just asking and recommending it as a cancer preventer is probably the best tool to actually starting vaccination. This slide shows that, that we underestimate how important parents think vaccines are. So the, the perceived and real concerns of parents um, influence how the clinician recommends and administers HPV vaccination. So if you walk in the room and be like, well, there's this vaccine, I know there's some bad things about it, and some people don't want it, but it is really recommended. You're going to get a different response than you walk in and say, hey, we're going to give your child this vaccine today that helps prevent cancer. Um, so having them opt out rather than opting in is another thing that I found has been helpful. The... Um, Effective recommendations is the main reason. So how we present and the conversation is one of the primary decision factors of parent actually getting the vaccine. So the same way, so effective recommendations um, group all the adolescent vaccines together. So you're gonna recommend that when they get their booster shots for middle school typically is when the pediatricians do it, that it's grouped in with it. This is just a standard vaccine that we give to all kids in this age group. And they also recommend that when you give your Tdap and your meningococcal vaccine that you give your HPV the same day. This is how um, Dr. Ionis did this for my son when he started last year. And then they chased him around the room with a needle. It's great. Um, just go walk in the room. And this starts with the nurse, really. Um, the nurse and how you frame it with all of the staff in the office. Like this is, your preteen needs these sort of vaccines today um, to protect against meningitis, HPV cancers, and pertussis. 
So the sample conversation, there's lots of these in here. We'll read some of them. So now that Sophia is 11, she's due for three vaccines today. These will help protect her from the infection that caused meningitis, pertussis, and HPV cancers, which the parents will probably know what meningitis is. Um, so you might want to simplify a little bit. But um, we'll get these shots at the end of the week. And honestly, I do talk about preventing cancer, but if you throw in genital warts in there, everybody knows what those are. And they're gross. <laughs> they, they can be treated, um, but it's not something you want to go into your doctor and be like, hey, I got these bumps down here. Um, and this is a, the expanded conversation. Some parents um, accept the bundled recommendation. Others have questions, um, and they need to know that you are okay with it. I have patients ask me that specifically. Is it okay that we give all our kids our babies vaccines at the same time? So I don't obviously give those, but the mothers will come in, and they're like, they want to give all these vaccines at the same time. And I reassure them as a physician and a parent, you know, yes, actually find that the vaccinations are more effective when given together, and there's not any harm as well as fewer doctor visits, less exposure to coming in the doctor. If your kid's coming in every six weeks to get a shot, they're gonna be freaked out. Um, so fewer visits for shots that are painful. Um, and also make sure that you're asking parents what their actual concern is. Sometimes it's whether or not their insurance is gonna pay for it. So why do you need the HPV vaccine? I think you guys can all answer that question, I hope. Um, what cancers are caused. So I do, especially in the, um, when talking to parents, sometimes they'll ask about it for their male trend. I said, we know you can get penile cancer. All you have to do is tell them they could get penile cancer and they all want it. So <laughs> truly that's not that often, but it is an HPV related cancer. Um, and then cancers of the throat. A lot of people know smokers that have throat cancer and that's a very common one. So I like to throw that one out there too. Um, anal cancer and of course cervical cancer. Um, it always gets awkward and they're like, well, my mom had cervical cancer. I'm like, yeah, she should have had the vaccine and I don't know what to tell you. Um, in this age group, I probably wouldn't start by discussing that it's a sexually transmitted disease. I do in my population because they're having sex. Um, so I say, hey, this is what you catch too. Um, if you can get pregnant, you probably got HPV unless it's you know a monogamous relationship where they've been protected. But um, we see plenty of younger younger pregnant teens that may or may not have been vaccinated. Um, and I do get a question a lot of times if they can continue their vaccines through pregnancy or if they're inadvertently given an HPV vaccine during pregnancy is actually a class B, it's considered safe. However, we typically delay it until after the pregnancy just because it is somewhat unknown. So if it's inadvertently given, it's okay. Um, but typically we do delay until after pregnancy. Um, why? <laughs> I'm not sure I've had this conversation, but why do you do it before age 11 or 12? I guess you can discuss, you know, get your bike helmet on before you go on your bike, get your age before you start having sex. Um, I, I mean, I am that blatant sometimes, but <laughs> when do we put our seatbelts on? Well, for me, when I'm leaving the driveway, but. Uh, <laughs> So we, I mean, the, the biggest thing I say is that you have to have the vaccine before you start having sex for maximum effectiveness. However, and I'm not sure it's put in here, but in my age group, a lot of patients are already sexually active. Some of them have already had abnormal pap smears and the chance that somebody has been exposed to all nine types of the HPV in the vaccine is very rare. So even if they have had cervical dysplasia, we still recommend vaccination to help prevent against the other types. So sometimes I'm like, well, why would I want the vaccine? Because I already have HPV. Well, there's there's good reasons why. Um, it, however, does not do anything to the types they already have. So unfortunately, it's not any kind of a cure for HPV. And then uh, apparently, I'm sorry that I was not aware of this, you only need two shots of vaccine um, at the younger age. And that's a great reason to start young, if you have kids like me that are running away from the nurse. <laughs> um, I have heard this lots of times. Of course, if they're in my office, then they already probably have some concerns. Sometimes see young girls for you know, irregular periods, but a lot, they're already concerned about them having sex by the time they come to see me. And it, it does, it's frustrating for us because we're not part of the Vaccines for Children program. We have people come in for birth control and I'll discuss the HPV vaccine, but I cannot vaccinate them the same day, which really does bother me. I think it would be best if we could do that. Um, but at this point, we just have to send them to the health department. I always hand literature to the patient before they walk out the door um, that if you're concerned about your kids having sex and they haven't had this vaccine, they need it. Um, 
Now, they've actually studied this. Um, numerous research studies have shown this is not the case. Um, it does not make it more likely for kids to become sexually active, sexually active or start having sex at a younger age. Um, another question I get, which is probably not in here, but I have uh, married couples, younger married women who say, well, I'm married, I'm only with one partner, why would I need the HPV vaccine? And I simply say, you know, you can have the vaccine until you're 26. You don't know at 46 or 56 if you're going to be with your same partner. We hope that we are, but people die. There's accidents, there's divorce. And why not get the vaccine now that may prevent you later in age? I see plenty of women in their 70s that have a new onset of HPV vaccine or a new onset of HPV. So the two-dose schedule is recommended if the series is started before the 15th birthday. Um, and you could say specifically that you don't wait to give the vaccine until they get older. And we know the reason why is because sex is typically initiated um, or sexual activity begins to be initiated at a young age. By 15, there are quite a few people that have already started uh, messing around. So um, the safety concerns, the things you read online, there, there really is. If you search Gardasil side effects, there is a ton of stuff online about bad news of a Gardasil. Um, so how do we know it's safe? Um, it says that, you know, the conversation you could have with a patient, it sounds like you're generally in support of vaccine, but you're concerned about this specific safety. Um, so we can share things about um, the fact the vaccine has been studied for a long time, like I said, up to 20 years now. And based on the, d the data, the actual scientific data, that it is very safe. And I would recommend that you look at the data yourself because I feel a lot more confident telling my patients that the vaccine is safe since I've personally looked at the data, which I have. Um, and once I looked through it, um, I had no issues whatsoever um, giving the vaccine to my kids. The only thing that's really weird, if you can get the actual data, um, Merck created the, the most common vaccine and have most studies. They don't actually publish their data publicly. Um, and they actually created their own um, unit of the amount of antibody and they call them millimerc units. I think that's very merc, yeah. Millimerc units of the uh, antibodies in the response. So it's like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, so you can have side effects. I do talk about the um, fact that this is something that we do see fainting for and that it can happen. It is hurt. It doesn't hurt to be honest with your patient. It's going to hurt. Um, could the HPV cause problems with fertility? Um, no, the vaccine can't, but getting HPV sure can. Um, so we do talk about that. It's not, um, you know, if they have cervical cancer, like my patient is 31, it's going to affect her fertility. The HPV virus itself, when people have it already, they'll come and ask me now, do I have HPV? I'm going to have trouble getting pregnant. Typically that answer is no. Even the treatments that we do early on with a LEAP procedure, um, aren't shown to have negative impacts on fertility. So I do try to reach her, my group because a lot of them come to me after they already have HPV. And you can throw in there that it doesn't cause people to die or neurologic conditions. Um, there were a few cases of Guillain-Barre in the um, studies, but it wasn't more than the general population. Um, I think there was also, when they listed, they did the first studies, they had listed somebody who died in a car accident, is listed, it's thrown in there, and obviously wasn't related to the vaccine at all. But when Merck is studying, they were very thorough in actually collecting death data on all their patients. So um, it is pretty interesting to read through. So how do we know if the vaccine works? Well, now we can say the truth is we've seen the data. We've seen the data, especially from other countries, that there's fewer infections, fewer genital warts, fewer precancers, uh, and they've all decreased in the 10 years, um, which when you think about it, 10 years really isn't that, that, it's a decent amount of time now, but it's not that long. Um, so why do you boys need vaccines? Well, <laughs> um, because they can get penis cancer, it's the best answer. Um, but HPV infections, they cause problems in men too. I mean, men come in with warts. They like to show us sometimes. Uh, and I tell them I don't do that part. Um, but they, yeah, herpes too, it's great. Um, so getting the HPV vaccine will help prevent the infection for your son that leads to those diseases. So you don't necessarily need to focus on, well, it'll keep his girlfriend from getting cervical cancer. No, it actually does help him too. The only one the vaccines ready for school. Um, 
we, I mean, I would just explain, well, the school is not too concerned about your child spreading HPV around at school, but it does not mean it's not important for its health. <laughs> would I give the HPV to my child? Yes, I have. Um, and if you don't have a child, you could say, if I had a child or my niece and nephew, I'd strongly recommend it. A family member asked me, but they trust you. Um, studies have shown people do trust their doctor. They trust what their doctor does. And one of the best things that you can give as testimony is the fact that you would give it to your own kid. Um, new HPV vaccine that works better. Um, so if you've had, and what they're getting at is if you had the child that had the Gardasil 4, whether or not to do a booster for Gardasil 9, they don't recommend that at this time. But I have had that question. And when you need to come back, um, six months to a year for younger than 15. And again, in mine, I have them schedule their two month follow up when they get their first shot. So they're already on the nurse's schedule. They walk in. And I don't know how other offices do it. Maybe, Dr. Beal, you can share in your office. We don't have physician appointments for vaccines once they have their initial one. So it's really, really helpful, especially my Truman students say, hey, you don't have to wait two hours to see me again. You can just come in on the nurse's visit and get your shot and go. Do you guys do the same same thing? So a lot of offices do that. It is awesome just to tell them, hey, just come in and get your shot and go. They're way more likely to schedule that follow-up appointment if they know they don't have to sit in your waiting room for an hour waiting to be seen. Okay, so it looks like if they start the third, um, two shots given six to 12 months apart. And if they do... Um, the two shots less than five months apart, so they're gonna need the ones that are at least six months apart. And I don't know if they have, um, I don't see this in here yet, but the other question I get a lot from my population is like, well, as I kid, I got my two shots, I didn't get my third shot, do I have to start over? And the answer is no, you do not restart the vaccination series. If they receive two Gardasil of the four, um, the quadrivalent, we still just give the Gardasil nine, that's all we carry. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's been 10 years, they can go ahead and get their last shot or their last two shots. So you do not have to restart. Um, if they decline, it is not final. I find that too. We check insurance benefits on our patients. So sometimes we can get them in this some days we can't um, get the vaccine because over the age of 18 or 19, some insurances do not pay for HPV vaccination, which I think is a tragedy because the cost of treating HPV related diseases is huge. Um, but we do have them, um, we check insurance benefits for a patient and we are part of Merck's um, program to provide free vaccines for patients whose insurances don't cover, but it is an application process. We have to have them fill out the application. So we do try to get insurance benefits. We get that checked. We promise them a call back. And we promise them a quick visit back in to get the shot. Um, so if they decline, if they wanna postpone, send them home with literature. Um, let them at least agree that they're going to read about it. They're going to discuss it. And um, I, I'm not sure if anybody asked, do you guys have a, dec a form to decline a vaccine? I don't know. Anybody have a vaccine declination? Do you de to have them decline other vaccines? Do you have them sign if they're not going to do vaccinations? We actually just started doing vaccinations. So most of ours have been Okay. I bet you have better rates now. You're doing them in the office. <laughs> You can't do the vaccines for children program. That's too bad. Yeah, that's that's huge. For those of you who aren't, does anybody not know? Raise your hand if you don't know what vaccines for children is. Everybody's heard of it. Okay. Um, how to increase the number of target patients who come and leave vaccinated? Know your coverage rates. Um, I've never done that before. Um, increase the target patients come in and leave, you know, immunize every opportunity. I find that having my nurses ask if the patients have been vaccinated is helpful. I have new nurses the last six months and they don't ask. And it's harder for me to remember, especially when I'm not giving out vaccines regularly, to, to remember to ask my patient if they've been vaccinated or not. I try to remember on the annual exams if I've seen that they haven't. Um, but getting the, your staff when the first time they come in to start asking about the vaccinations can be helpful. And the, the last slide was just that opener by your medical assistant. Like, you know, 
do you have any questions? If they hesitate, say our doctor is going to talk to you about it. And then making sure that your medical assistant or nurse is coming in with you and saying, hey, you need to talk to this person about the vaccine. Um, and if I have somebody who hasn't been vaccinated, I know I will, and they're waiting there, I will actually have our nurse take in like a HPV vaccination pamphlet into the parent, especially if it's a younger girl coming in for birth control, say she's 15, 16 years old, coming in for a contraceptive visit, I will have them send it in so they can start reading about it before I get in the room and kind of put that in their mind. HD, the CDC website for vaccine. Um, and I think that's the end of this presentation. Um, does anybody have specific questions about HPV or the vaccine? Is there a right. So the question is on whether or not we have to restart vaccinations if it's been too long. And, and the question is, no, you don't ever have to restart, which a lot of people like to hear that too. They're way more likely to get the last one if they know they don't have to get three. They don't recommend to do it while you're pregnant. Just um, if it happens, it's okay, but they recommend continuing after the pregnancy. And honestly, that's the same with a lot of different vaccines. So if they got one shot earlier at like day when they were 14 and then they're coming back at 16, you could then do the additional? Yes. I would. I would have to look this up for the what their guidelines are, but I would. Does anybody know when that changed? Uh, um, November 16, like, okay. Yeah, the last time I heard this talk was Shaquilla was before that, though. So. <laughs> I said, nobody in the guard cell rep hasn't, hasn't come and done his job to tell us about that. <laughs> we see him all the time. He brought us lunch yesterday, actually. <laughs> but again, it's not, it's not really our population. So I apologize for that. Have you seen any side effects in your population? Um, only the passing out. I wasn't really a big stickler for making them stay until one fell down the hall. Now they all stay. <laughs> so, and they always complain about it hurting. So, but you know what, getting your, there is no nice way to get genital warts off at all. They're cut off, they're frozen off, they're lasered off, and they all hurt. So even using like Amiquimod or TCA, Condolux, they hurt. It hurts. So if they, they're like, oh, it hurts, I'm like, well, you know what hurts worse? Getting the words cut off your vagina or your penis. <laughs> so there's lots of ways to convince. I mean, if there's a pain issue, that's not a good reason not to do it. I had one patient say after they got their first guard to still shot is when they started getting migraine. How would you respond to that? Approach it. Um, I would say that studies don't show that, and I'm sorry that that happened. Um, we could call the neurologist and talk to the neurologist if they think that's a, a reason for concern of not getting a second a second shot. Um, I would still strongly recommend the vaccine because it's very, very unlikely that that was the cause for migraines. But there will be people you can never convince. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your time and attention. If you ever have a question, you feel welcome to call um, or ask, and I'm sure Dr. Yannis probably it feels the same way. Thank you very much. The only thing I would add is just to please give us some feedback on the evaluation forms on the tables, and we appreciate you coming. and. If um, the, the, the PowerPoint and the handouts that were sent to you electronically, the students, if you are interested in statistics from a different state, because all we included was the state of Missouri, we have that available. So just let me know and I can get that for, uh, for you in terms of the profile of a different state. So thank you very much. Have a great day. I don't see a chat box over here, so. Okay. Do I recommend, um, so the question is, do you recommend patients abstain from sex until the series of shot is complete? Um, I think that that wouldn't be a bad recommendation, although I'm highly unlikely that a vaccination is gonna cause someone to abstain from sex. 
What I do tell them is they still need to use condoms every time because the condoms are very effective in preventing it as well as preventing other infections that are um, cause other issues. So I don't know that I've specifically ever recommended they abstain. Very much. It's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs>